All right. Now we are. Oh, yeah. There we go. At this point, I'd like to call to order the Budget and Finance Committee. Before we begin, I just want to let you know the good news. The good news is we have three regulations that will be on the full agenda tomorrow because we approved them in June. That is 7.001, tuition and fees, 7.003, fees, fines, and penalties, and 9.017, faculty practice plans. We noticed them. We received virtually no comments, so they're going straight to the board tomorrow, and we need not discuss them today. So that said, Mikey, would you please call the roll? Uh, yes, your vice chair is Mr. Beard. Here. Ms. Duncan. Here. Mr. Hosseini. Right here. Uh, Dr. Marshall has an excused absence. Mr. Rood? Here. Mr. Tripp? Here. Mr. Long? Mr. Long is here. Uh, Mr. Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you, Mikey. In your packets, or on your electronic packets anyways, you received the minutes from the June 23, 2011 meeting. Are there any changes, deletions, or is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Second. Got a motion and a second to approve the meeting minutes. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. And opposed. Motion carries. The next item for today, we're going to review the university operating budgets and the university and the board office LBRs. So we're going to get a lot of Tim Jones today. <laughs> so our, uh, as you know, our board's master powers and duties require us to review the university operating budgets, and Tim's going to give us an overview of the university operating budgets first. Tim Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and it is a lot more exciting to have you do these presentations than me. So. But I thought I'd give you a break this time. Appreciate that, sir. The first issue is the annual approval of the university system operating budgets. And pursuant to your board regulation, all of the university budgets conform to that operating regulation. They've also indicated maintaining a 5% reserve as required in the statute and the regulation. And they've all been approved by the boards of trustees as required. And just one more slide. I just want to show you the kind of the magnitude of the budget this year over over ten billion dollars. This is the first time our system operating budget has exceeded ten billion. And you'll notice that really only a third of that, the green piece, is related to is ENG and related to the direct instruction of our students. Contracts and grants, auxiliaries, local funds make up the other um, roughly two thirds but very important components that support uh, the education of our students. So I'll be glad to answer any questions, Mr. Chair, on the operating budget, if the committee has any. Great. We have full text of those budgets available if anyone would like to see them. Um, but are there any questions on the general operating budgets of the universities? All right. Seeing none, may I have a motion then to approve the SUS 2011-2012 operating budgets? We have a motion. Is there a second? And a second. Any discussion or questions? Seeing none, all in favor of approving the SUS 2011-2012 operating budgets, please say aye. 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 And opposed. The motion carries. Thank you. The next item is going to take a little more time and conversation. That's our review of our 2011, I'm sorry, 2012-2013 LBR requests for the university system and the board offices. Now, we recognize clearly that the economy has stabilized a little bit over the last 12 months, and that's probably generous, but there is still a great deal of fear about another recession and how that recession, if it hits, will impact Florida has yet to be seen. Um, those of us on the committee have been kept up to date by Tim on the monthly revenue collections compared to the monthly estimates, and through July, the July revenues for the year have been pretty much on target. So that's good news, but the future is still a little uncertain. The legislative budget instructions that we received, or all state agencies received actually, including the universities, asked us to prepare a 10% budget reduction plan for next year. I know that's not good news for anyone, but these are also just plans at this time, and it's prudent to anticipate what may happen if the worst occurs, and the legislature is being properly cautious. So Tim's going to talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes as he goes through the LBR. We also know that as we continue to tighten our belts, our universities have got to continue to look for more and more efficiencies, best practices, and yes, Governor Duncan shared services. Um, included in your materials, actually, towards the back, you're going to find a lot of information on the various initiatives that our universities have taken to save some money, to combine, to share services, and what they've been engaged in. And I think you'll find them pretty enlightening and educational. They've done a nice job. 
Now, the budget that Tim is going to walk us through now, the LBR, is clearly an advocacy budget. There's no doubt about that. And it includes in that budget, as its cornerstone, the new Florida initiative, which focuses on STEM research and access and improving graduation rates. Both of these are the cornerstones to our efforts to produce more degrees, particularly in areas of critical need, as we continue to work as the state university system to improve Florida's economy. And we're going to hear a lot more about that in Governor Martin's strategic planning committee later on or tomorrow. But just so you know, our LBR lines up with the strategic planning initiatives that are coming out of Governor Martin's strategic planning committee. So Tim, without further ado or build up, why don't you walk us through the 2012-2013 LBR? Uh, thank you, sir. And before I get actually get into the details of that, let's just kind of go over a little bit about the fiscal uh, situation the state has. We heard the, a little bit about the PICO, so we'll look at the operating side. And this is lottery and general revenue uh, projections. You can see the last four years, the volatility in, in those two sources of revenue. And then 11-12 at 25.1 billion. And the latest projections, which um, from this past spring and summer shows a continued growth of lottery, mainly primarily GR, uh, a little bit of lottery. So the, at least the outlook has it being a little rosy. Uh, just two weeks ago, the legislature released their three-year financial outlook, which is required. And last year we were looking at this slide and that balance was about a $3.6 billion deficit. Uh, this year you can see the balance is actually in the black uh, about $300 million. So they would show about $27 billion in available GR, funding the state's base, covering some critical and high priority needs, and I'll go over those in just a moment, maintaining a reserve, and still having a little bit of money left over. Now that was um, tempered once the report was released about uh, the possibility of GR being lowered during the next estimating conference, which will be sometime this fall in advance of the governor's budget recommendations. So we expect this balance of 273 to decline, if not go into the red just a little bit. And then there would be another GR conference in January as the legislature prepares their budget. Now this just focuses on uh, what the university system has looked like in the past. And you can see for the last five years, we've received a 22% decrease in state appropriations. Now you heard Dr. Jessel talk earlier about a 29%, and that 29% was cuts to the base. So if you take into account other appropriations we've had received for like plant operations and maintenance, funding for new medical schools, other legislative priorities, the net of that is about a 22% decrease. Uh, going forward, the three-year financial outlook from the legislature showed an increase in state appropriations, uh, I'm sorry, university appropriations of about 10%, so a little over $200 million over a three-year period. So at least that was the good news in the original projections. So what issues were the legislature looking at funding in their outlook? They had looked at funding increased access, about $40 million a year for growth, continued funding for the FIU and UCF medical schools, continued funding for plant operations and maintenance for new facilities. And we heard in the facilities committee that there's also the big need for existing facilities. We will have that in our LBR a little bit later, but at least they've recognized the P&M for new facilities. They also project a 7.5% base tuition increase and just a little bit of funding for the Cortellus matching program. So not a whole lot of uh, new issues in there, but some very important base issues. And finally, this is just the board office um, appropriations for the last five years, and you can see how the board office um, has declined in terms of positions and funding. So I just want to provide a little bit of that background before we get into the actual LBR. And I'll start off with this 10% reduction plans that the legislature uh, required everybody to do. And you would see a 10% cut for the university system would be about $199 million. 
that would be in addition to the 730 plus million that we have received in base cuts over the last few years. Um, all the universities have submitted plans to our office. They've continued to, they'll be, continue to look at raising positions, eliminating uh, positions, uh, additional reductions possibility in the student enrollments. We heard FSU come out with that uh, last week as part of their um, presentation to their board of trustees. Um, consolidation of campuses. I think universities would look at all options if they were required to take another 10% uh, reduction. This is just the highlight of uh, the uh, LBR request. You can see the ENG core budget is estimated to grow by 7.1% if our LBR was officially approved. Uh, if you add in our special units, IFAS, the health science centers, and our medical schools, overall a 6.6% increase. If you look at some other areas that are funded within the university system, the Institute of Human Machine Cognition, major gifts, distance learning, it jumps to about 15%. So that big jump is really caused by the major gift request of $283 million. I just want to show a couple of slides. Even though the university's uh, budgets have taken a, a big hit the last few years, you can see our headcount enrollment has continued to increase, and Dr. Jessel alluded to that as well. So we're continuing to provide access for students. Um, degree production has also continued to grow in STEM and in non-STEM areas and even at the graduate degree level. So we're continuing to enroll students, we're continuing to produce degrees, even with the declining budgets that we've had. So what are some of our key LBR issues? And you'll recall during the work plan presentations back in June, universities presented what their needs were, and they tied those to various goals and metrics that they had, as well as the metrics that we have in our strategic plan. Now we looked at all of those issues that were submitted and we kind of put them in two buckets. We put STEM and research issues in one bucket, access, improving graduation rates, retention rates in another bucket. So that's gonna be the focus of our LBRs, really those two key pieces. And what we're not bringing forward are individual university issues. Um, there were many issues that had not come to the board for full deliberation yet, so we want to take a, a broader approach and ask for funding in these two areas, with the goal being if we received any appropriations from the legislature for them, we could first go back to their work plans, see what they had intended to do with them. If that was still the case, then determine what their accountability metrics would be to ensure success. And then we could bring those back to the board for approval before the funds were released to them for action. So the first area is STEM and research of $91 million. It's broken down into several smaller issues, and these are based on some of the, uh, the information we had received from the universities. Uh, our provost also met over the summer and identified eight system-wide issues that they wanted to include. $10 million for world-class scholars, similar to the $10 million in new Florida funding we received last year. Um, 2.1 million for the Small Business Development Center. And there is narrative in your packet on all of these. And so if someone has a question about any particular one, just let me know and we'll walk through it in a little more detail. Also, the Florida Institute of Oceanography of $1.2 million for continued um, really staff support for that organization. In the Professional Science Master's Program, uh, $300,000 for a uh, couple of staff to help coordinate that for the system, and that's been, the program's been before this uh, board before. So then the second bucket is access and graduation rates. We have several universities who talk to you about wanting to grow, <coughs> Florida Gulf Coast, uh, University of North Florida, um, FIU, FAU. So we've included funding for access, Many universities wanted to improve the graduation rates by hiring additional faculty, improving their tracking systems. The uh, VPs for the Council of Student Affairs have identified a need of $5 million for auxiliary learning aids for our disabled students. And that was moved forward through the provost and to the chancellor. 
as well as continued funding for FIU and UCF medical school implementation. Uh, this is an issue for New College that we've had in our budget for a number of years. It originally started out at 5.7 million. We've uh, received the bulk of that, but it's been very difficult to receive that last 1.3 million. Uh, they'll get a little bit of non-recurring funds every year, but uh, 1.3 million to finish that uh, request. And finally, we have the Distance Learning Consortium, uh, which works for all of our higher ed institutions on distance learning issues of $700,000. And finally, we have the Florida Critical Language Network, that's really a new initiative working on various foreign uh, uh, languages, a couple of staff people to help coordinate that for the system as well. Other key LBR issues, p and m you heard about this during the facilities meeting this includes requests for new facilities as well as funding for existing facilities. The Moffitt Cancer Center is looking to expand their research for their total cancer care operations. You're going to be hearing a presentation from Moffitt tomorrow during the full board. The Institute of Human and Machine Cognition which operates a site in Ocala as well as Pensacola wanting to expand, expand their research, particularly in terms of areas of robotics for veterans, and they will be presenting tomorrow as well. And finally, the major gift matching endowment program of almost uh, $283 million. And then when the chancellor had his conference call with the board of trustee chairs last week, this came out as a very important issue for many of our trustee chairs, and it has, as well as it has been for this board. I just want to uh, show the magnitude of this program, the successes it has had. Since it was created in 1970, in the late 1970s as the Eminent Scholar Chair, then it was changed to the Major Gift Matching Program in 1985. Over 4,300 permanent endowments have been created for the system. Uh, over th about 327 chairs, and the rest have been endowments for scholarships, professorships, research initiatives, libraries. So it has created a, a lot of good base support for institutions. Currently, we have 1.5 billion in those endowments. 1.1 billion of that is from the private donations we have received. The state has matched 407 million and we have pending the 283 million. So once this program would be fully funded, about 1.8 billion in endowments for the university system. The overall request just for ENG amounts to about a $577 per FTE increase. And that's all for the university system. Then finally the board general office, there's a revised uh, sheet on uh, where you're at, we have changed our budget request from when you were brief. We're currently requesting a flat budget, no increase. This just shows some technical changes that were required to do per uh, budget instructions from the governor and legislature this year. So no increase in positions or funding for the board office. And Mr. Chair, that concludes the LBR presentation. Thank you, Tim. Are there any questions or comments for Tim? Governor Colson. Well, I am not. I I apologize because I'm not on your committee, but earlier you, you showed a slide that's, that I think it was $736 million in less government funding today for the state university system than, than was four years ago or something like that? It's uh, over $700 million in base budget cuts. Now that has partially been offset by, by tuition increases. There's been other funding for specific initiatives such as medical schools or P.O.N.M. but yes over 700 million to the base but is that a cumulative number so it's 200 million a year times four years or is that the base is 700 million less than it was the base is 700 million less than what it was and, and any idea how much tuition has generated to offset that 700 million dollar loss um, you can go back here we'll go back to this slide right quick and you can actually see it's uh, been about $500 million. So the net? In so right here you can see in 07 08, we were at $963 million, and we're currently at $1.5 billion, so almost $500 million in tuition increases against and $783 and enrollment billion. Growth. And enrollment growth. Yes, yes, it would be growth in students and tuition. 
Governor Nuckin. Yes, um, Mr. Chair, one um, question that I have is, and I do get the whole not trying to break out special projects, but there's one um, considering the work that we've been doing with research and economic development that I'm particularly concerned about. It's the Mag Lab in Tallahassee. Um, that application, as I understand it, just went in in the last couple of weeks, and it's really starting its review process with the decision being made in 2013. And there's, I guess, was that was one of the requests. And with it being the only national lab we have in the state, and it employs like 350 people, 1,000 people come from all over the world. I was just there two weeks ago. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a big deal in our research world here in the state. And I guess my concern is what I know of the application, I'm sure Provost Stokes could supplement what I'm saying here, um, is that they are looking for a state commitment to the, to the program, and that's a real important part of the criteria and the competition. And I'm just a little concerned by having it totally lumped in that we might be disadvantaging ourselves in that competition. So, Tim, clarify for me. Governor Duncan's concern, I think it's about a $3 million yes. line for the MAGLAB, is that it's lumped into the FSU budget and I guess you're asking that it be carved out as a separate line in the FSU budget? Well, I don't know. I think it's in the general STEM area is probably where it would be in the way we've lumped the budget together. So it's not really showing up anywhere. It could, but I guess it, and one of the concerns is just knowing how the veto process has worked. You know, if we don't get it called out and then it doesn't show up as something we specifically approved and then it were to get funded, by the legislature, we don't want it subject to a veto because it didn't go through our process. It's just this one's too high stakes to, to, to be taking chances with, I think. Tim, do you have any suggestions to assuage? Um, that's entirely at the committee's prerogative. If you want to pull that out of the STEM and research line to have it separately identified for the MAG lab, that can be done. Provost, is that what you're looking for from the university? Yeah. Is there any objection to that from the committee? Would you like to make that in the form of a motion, Governor Duncan? We've got a motion from Governor Tripp and a second, second from Governor Duncan. Any additional discussion? Seeing none, we'll call the question on that motion. Please signify by saying aye. 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 Or opposed. Thank that carries. Thank you, Governor Duncan. Any other questions, concerns with regard to the LBR and or the board operating, operating budget as it stands? Seeing none, then I will call the question. I'm going to need two motions, one for the LBR, one for the board operating budget. So all in favor of the... 2011-2012 LBR request for the state university system and please allow in your motion that the chancellor can make whatever technical changes may be necessary as we move forward. All in, uh, is there a motion to approve that motion from Governor Tripp? Second. Second, Governor Duncan. Any discussion? If not, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed. The LBR for 2011-2012 carries. And now we need a motion for the 2011-2012 legislative budget request for the board office. Once again, if your motion would include uh, some flexibility for the chancellor to make whatever technical changes are necessary, is there a motion? Second. Motion Governor Tripp, second and Governor Duncan. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of that motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed. The motion carries. Thank you, Tim. Thank if you. there's any additional questions or information wanted, all of this is up on our website, the, the date of the budgets, the backup is all there. Um, I know we were all briefed, but it seemed like a pretty quick process to go through a couple billion dollars. But uh, <laughs> please, if you have any questions, take a look-see. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of flexibility. And because of that, and, and because we know that uh, Governor Colson's committee is going to have their hands full in the legislature, I want to once again call on us as a board and as our universities to work together this session and try to push system priorities through the legislative process when and as we're up there with our relationships. This is, this is a definitely high tide floats all boats scenario, and if we can help each other through this process, it's going to be very helpful. Um, finally, included in your packet and in the board in the meeting agenda was our committee's work plan for the next year and a half. You will notice our November meeting has the possibility of being interesting and lively, as we will review university market rate tuitions and any block tuition proposals that we may receive. Those all of those proposals are due in the board office September 28th. As soon as we get them, you will get them. Um, and then we will talk about them at the November board meeting. Um, other than that, just be aware that at the board meeting this afternoon, I'll be bringing three action items forward. Um, first will be the 2011-2012 operating budgets we approved. 
Next will be the LBR we just approved and the board office budget we just approved as well as those consent items that we talked about at the beginning of the meeting. Is there anything else for the good of the committee or the board? Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Absolutely. I'm, Governor Husseini. Uh, um, we have about, what, 325,000 students totally, all together, roughly. Um, how many, anybody knows how many of them are a STEM program? I think we saw those numbers on a slide earlier. Um, those are those, those, those the degrees. I'm trying to get the number of students on those degrees. See, I'm going to ask Tim a question that he doesn't know. Oh, no, he'll know the answer more. <laughs> figure that out. I, I know mean, someone. Because he knows everything. And unlike me, he won't make up the answer. He'll actually yes. give us a couple of minutes. <laughs> and that, then I have a quote that gets back to the math of it. So if we want to increase the number of STEM graduates, not degrees, let's say the degrees we have is enough of it, but if we plan, let's say that we want to increase the number of students we have, in the current degrees in STEM, we want to increase the, what kind of costs are we looking? You know, it's much easier to get, let's say, a degree in history than getting a degree in a science. And I'm just trying to see what is the, the difference, you know. One time I asked a university president that, um, why do you have, um, you know, lower level and higher level, why don't you have more of higher level? He said, well, our cost is less in lower level, which is, makes sense, so we can spend it on the higher level. My question is that if we have a degree in history or a degree in science, are they different in cost? And how much is that cost different? If we decide tomorrow that if you look at in totality the number of STEM in total that we in Florida produce is one of the lowest level in the country. And my question is, what does it cost for us to increase that number to get more students graduate at a STEM um, graduation? Mr. Chairman, um, if I might, um, maybe a, a good response might come from the universities on this one. I, the idea being that if we were successful in receiving that money and that money were distributed to the universities specifically for the purpose of exactly what you're talking about, Governor, which is to increase the pool of STEM students and ultimately the, the number who are graduating. Uh, Dr. Glover, would you, is that okay with you? If, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> uh, uh, if, if I could, I'll just make one or two comments. Uh, I, I think they're in the direction you're, you're searching for, but stop me if I'm getting off base. Uh, there, there have been some national studies on this. The most prominent one that, that comes to mind is called the Delaware Cost Study which looks at the relative cost of education by discipline. So it compares the cost of education, for example, in history to the cost of education in, in engineering. Um, it, I, I would characterize it as a, as, as a, as a broad brush study. Uh, there's lots of um, differences that in there. Um, but, but in fact, you know, the cost of science um, majors is usually associated with, with several things. One being the cost of laboratories, which you cannot, which number one, requires certain facilities, and which number two, you can't teach in large sections, uh, both because you need individual instruction, but also because of safety reasons. I mean, you do not want 300 students milling around with dangerous chemicals in, in a laboratory. So, so that, that is one issue. A second issue is the faculty that, that you hire um, to teach <clears throat> science often themselves have their own requirements for laboratories and the, the competitive market and the salary ranges is, is often different from the salary ranges, for example, in the humanities. So, so there are a number of factors that, that make the sciences uh, in general more expensive and the Delaware cost study is, is a good indication. Uh, I think, for example, uh, if you look if you compared business courses to, to engineering, I, I vaguely remember that there's, there's a difference, there's, there's like a, a, a factor of 13 difference between them. So there, you know, the costs do vary significantly. So I'm, I'm sorry, in summary, I, I would say that if you want to increase the delivery of STEM degrees, and by that I mean laboratory-based STEM degrees as opposed to, for example, mathematics, the primary increased costs are going to be associated with laboratory facilities for both the students and the faculty, faculty salaries, 
and the fact that some things just must be done on an individual basis. We, uh, Dr. Glover, let me, uh, can I just follow up on that? Uh, Certainly, Governor. Um, I have a, um, let's say that at University of Florida, you have the highest number of graduates at STEM, and then it goes down. Um, but if you look at national average, um, um, uh, we're below the average by far. Do you make any conscious decision to say, you know, a STEM degree is going to cost us more money. That means we're going to need more money. For that reason, we're going to offer less degree in a STEM. No, in, in fact, quite, quite the opposite. The University of Florida is, is driven really to keep on the frontiers of, of STEM for a variety of reasons that, that I could go into. And so, in fact, uh, on your agenda at this board meeting is a request to grant um, a, a new degree limited access status. It'll be in biomedical engineering. It's extremely expensive. We're putting resources into that. But we feel that this is an incredibly important, not just for the university, but for the entire state of Florida, because we don't think that the state of Florida has appropriate capacity in this field at this point. So, you know, we, we do what we can with the, with the budget that we have available, but we are making every effort to, um, to, to work in the state's interest in developing STEM degrees. So let me ask you, uh, the rest of the university presidents, is there ever, when you offer degrees in a state, you ever cost comes in your mind and he says, uh, wait a minute, um, we can't offer STEM because it's going to cost us more money. And then when you put all of it together in totality, we are one of the lowest states in the country that offers STEM. And I'd like to hear there's university presidents that have a yeah. comment on that. Maury, I think, I think there's a little bit of a chicken and egg thing. The student demand is, is a key issue. And so I think if you wanted, if we wanted to increase student demand to go into the STEM programs or the science programs, and again, there's exceptions. Med school's a different deal, but if you're looking at the engineering and some of the biology, chemistry, et cetera, um, what we would do is either differentiate tuition or set up scholarships to attract them into the programs. There is no question that they're more expensive to put on. But at a university, you sort of have the profit centers, uh, some of the, the, the liberal arts degrees that you have the larger sections with the lower paid faculty that you make money on to shift and to subsidize other parts of the university. So I think Joe is right on the cost. There's no expense. There's a cost issue. But I think the primary driver in many places is the demand issue, the interest. Dr. Genshaw. The other component is... Uh a large research university, these are the areas you're going to find most of the NSF funding available. A lot of federal funding comes in through the STEM degrees. So that you weigh um, the opportunities that you would have moving into this area for uh, grant writers and the kind of re return that you get on that investment, which is, uh, which is sizable. Plus you have corporate partners in these areas as well. I could just add a, a okay. comment. Uh, if you think of universities and components of universities as prestige maximi maximizing units, you won't go far wrong. Uh, there is a lot of prestige to be had in building top flight STEM programs. So that drives us. There is no question uh, that uh, universities are large uh, systems of cross subsidy, so that the references earlier to uh, uh, some of the social science and humanities disciplines with large sections, no laboratories, uh, they certainly generate revenues that can subsidize uh, the, uh, the STEM offerings. I would say there's no question that uh, universities work to offer as many STEM, uh, good solid STEM offerings as we can. The real question that uh, is, uh, the real factor that drives the production of degrees at this point is student demand. Uh, if we could find ways to bring more students who are properly qualified into the STEM disciplines, we would do it. Uh, and we would see a, a nice uh, increase in uh, degrees awarded in STEM disciplines that would follow that. Governor Tripp. Uh, that's exactly what I was going to say. Uh, on the, on the, 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 the issue that, that I would like to know is what is the capacity that the universities have right now in the STEM and, and how much do they need coming out of K through 12 uh, to do that? Uh, my understanding has been for a few years that we may have more capacity than we have students. 
Uh, I remember when I was on the board at FAU, there were certain uh, courses and subjects that we really wanted to do, but we couldn't find the students to fill them in math and, and things of that nature. So I think it would be important for us at some point in time to understand on a system-wide basis what capacity do we have and how many students could we take before it impacts us uh, financially. Now, I know there will be some level when we, when we finally say we've got more students than we've got capacity, but I'm not sure that, uh, Governor Hosseini, I'm not sure that's our issue at this point. It may be the issue for the commissioner uh, as he sits here, as he's looking to bring more students out of, out of K through 12, you know, and heading them into the university. And, and so I, I'm sure he's having those conversations, but that's, that's my, my view. And am I wrong on that? President Benz? Well, one of the things I wanted to add is that uh, in uh, our part of the state uh, is workforce demand. We find that the economic drivers uh, trying to get to economic development folks, trying to get good companies to relocate or to grow in our part of the state, need workers that are trained in some of the STEMs. Let's take software engineering, for example. Uh, and so what we're doing is we're looking at that, plus looking at um, the STEM uh, um, disciplines that the colleges need in their faculty to ramp up their their faculty. So the workforce demands are really driving us in identifying which STEMs we are going to invest in, which of the STEM fields. And uh, there you've got workforce demand, and where you have workforce demand, you will have students to enroll in them. And to get it started, like someone else said, you need to have uh, some student support to entice students in it. But the private sector will help you with that. And so uh, for us, workforce demand is very important in which STEMs we choose to invest in. And right now, we're, we're hiring like 30% of our arts and sciences faculty are in the STEM for that reason. Um, um, Tim, uh, so let me just, sure. Tim, does that slide shed some light on the topic? Or? Well, this is uh, going back to the original question. Jason had this data that shows a fall enrollments in STEM areas for baccalaureate, masters, and doctors. So I think it totals about 75,000 students pursue, uh, pursuing a STEM degree in this fall of last year. President Ammons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this, this slide goes back to um, an issue that uh, Governor Tripp uh, just asked about. There is uh, more uh, capacity uh, at the graduate level than at the undergraduate level. But let me tell you, because of the national need uh, that we have for students and graduates who are trained uh, in STEM areas, it is very, very important, uh, Commissioner, that we have a uh, supply of students uh, who are coming through the pipeline from uh, K-12 who can go into these areas. When you take a look at those enrollments, uh, and I think those are enrollments, but by the time they get to maybe their fourth year there, uh, maybe even their sophomore, junior year, because of the rigor that's required, some of those students are changing their majors. And the preparation coming from K through 12 uh, is a tremendous factor for us. One of the things that uh, Florida a and does because we're a national university is that we are recruiting nationally. But we would like to see more students from the state of Florida in these STEM programs and being able to take some of the jobs that President Benz talked about uh, that are here in the state of Florida and we are trying to attract more and more high-tech firms uh, to the state and they are looking to us uh, to produce that workforce. And so this is a critical topic for all of our institutions. But again, we want to get them through the baccalaureate degrees, get them to master's and doctoral degree programs with those degrees in hand. Thank you, Mr. President. President Rosenberg. Uh, if, if you look at it from a flow through, and the 
uh, initiative that we've had particularly at the high school level was to increase dual enrollment, which is in uh, public schools' interest. We found it a huge bottleneck in being able to do STEM uh, in dual enrollment is we don't have in our high schools laboratories that are going to be uh, accredited uh, by SACS, which means we can't teach those legitimate, we can't give those students who are really science oriented and proficient uh, college level classes uh, in our high schools because the laboratories are not there. Uh, as it relates to uh, the institution, our institution, uh, we are maxed out on labs as it relates to chemistry. We're teaching all day Saturday now, uh, labs. Uh, we're getting ready to start uh, biology teaching all day Saturday and probably we'll go to our laboratories teaching all day Sunday. But still, if we were to hire more faculty, they would not be interested in coming to e any of our universities unless they had their own laboratory space. And we are, you know, systematically uh, shifting uh, lab space to make sure it's most productively used, but we can't, we, we don't have the PICO funding at this point to build the labs that are going to attract the nationally competitive faculty who you would want to teach the students who you would subsequently be hiring. So it's, uh, uh, I, I think it varies by degree. Uh, we have a little bit of excess capacity still in engineering, not much, certainly not in chemistry. Uh, and biology, you know, we'll, 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 we'll address that uh, innovatively, but if we were to hire more faculty, we would be bottlenecked there. We'd like to have them more, more high school students coming in, but uh, the labs aren't there in the, in the high school setting. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, Governor Hussainian, as I pointed out in the budget presentation, we are very STEM heavy in this budget request as a goal for the system. Anything else, any other thoughts or concerns? Thank you for that conversation. It was meaningful. Governor? One thing that I might add is that when a student comes into a university deciding which degree route they're going to take, there's a lot of different factors that come into that. It's your, your experience in your high school education, your elementary school education, what your interests are. Um, but one thing that was mentioned was scholarships and providing students with opportunities. A lot of the things that we think about are what the job outlook is going to be. Can I afford college? When you have higher tuition rates like we have right now, if you're focusing on providing scholarships to those students who are taking advantage of the STEM style learning, you know, you will have a lot more students falling into those types of programs. Um, and it's also what a university is known for. For example, New College, if you come to New College, you're going to get a liberal arts education. You're not going to be focusing too heavily on your STEM-based activities. Um, if you go to Florida Gulf Coast University, you know that you're going to get a great education on environmental and ecological, um, and ecological areas. So a university pushing more of a STEM program and putting that out there so students know, oh, this is one of the university programs that I can go to would also be beneficial as well. Thanks, Cover. Anything else? President Benz. Just one more thing. I wanted to say that um, uh, we're working with the middle schools because that's usually where decisions are made. Do I really want to take another course in algebra or do I want to take a course in English? And their career goals are set. There's something called the National Flight Academy that's associated with the big uh, Naval Aviation Museum in Pensacola. And it is taking middle schoolers and high schoolers in a practical application of an aircraft carrier where they learn, do trig, do calculus, do all kinds of things uh, at that level, but they're solving problems for a week or so. You could call it immersion. And uh, that, that's killing two birds with one stone. One is, is giving young people in K through 12 an exciting experience using the STEM disciplines. And number two, it's great for the economy because it's bringing in students and their families uh, locally and, uh, and has a great economic impact. Those kinds of things. Now, we didn't really think this up, but what we're doing is being partners in it and, and moving it along with the software development, it's animation and immersion. So I, I think that's also a way that we as universities can begin to encourage interest in the STEM in K through 12. Thank you, Madam President. If Yes, I'm sorry. Well, Commissioner, it's all on you, it seems. <laughs> Very good introduction. First of all, let me thank Madam Chair for uh, the invitation, fellow board members. Um, when I was Secretary of Education in Virginia, we spent several months on, with a uh, Commission on Higher Education. A big focus on that was putting $100 million in new money on the table. A big chunk of that was focused on STEM education. Uh, you mentioned something very important, uh, laboratory skills. Uh, there is uh, someone on our commission named Joanne DeGenero. 
Uh, she is the president of the Center for Excellence in Education. Uh, it's the only program in the country that takes uh, gifted and high-performing students, sends them to MIT for a six-week residential program to learn those type, type of skills. Uh, there's a uh, national opening for that. Florida is in one of the states coming here now, make sure that we are one of the states, so that's a real issue. Number two, we have to make sure that we also take a look at trying to encourage our schools of education to provide scholarships and to also attract more people in that area. Because if you can't get the teachers out of the schools of ed with that kind of training, you're going to have a challenge. We may have to focus more on arts and science uh, as well. And, uh, and third, we're frankly going to have to find more mid-career professionals uh, to come in to teach who actually have experience in the subjects. Uh, they're ready, particularly those who are going through military and uh, moving forward. Uh, and the last uh, recommendation uh, here in terms of mid-career is we've got to have uh, an honest conversation about what aspect of STEM. Massachusetts is the only state in the country where they're focused on the E in STEM, where they're focusing on engineering at the elementary school level, much more on a conceptual standpoint. So great area for us to work in, and this will be a good time to have that conversation. Thank you, Commissioner, and welcome to the board. I know we'll be more formal a little bit later on in the day. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Governor Hussein. Um, <laughs> more of the story is that in Florida, uh, we, uh, we graduate one of the lowest STEM graduates in the country. And I think that should be a concern of ours. Um, engineers, are, there's a shortage of engineers today in this country. Um, and what should we do, I mean, starting from K-12, how do we treat our students? How do we get, uh, Chancellor is not here, I think, uh, I think it was Chancellor that was meeting with the group of executives uh, in Orlando and um, and he said, how can we help you? And they said, give us some math graduates. Uh, there is definitely a need for engineers and math graduates and so on and so forth. And when we look at it in totality, the number of students we graduate in a STEM, specifically engineering, is what can we do to increase that and, um, and to be able to, to put them in the uh, workforce quickly. Instead of you get a degree and you don't have a job to go to, so I think you're right. I think it's something that should start from the beginning, go to college. From what I understand, many p students register that they want to have a degree in math, and within one year, uh, they change their degrees. It's not funny enough, it's difficult, it's tough, and they're out to um, some different degrees, so. Thank you, Governor. If there's nothing else, our committee agenda is done. Is there a motion? A move. Motion to adjourn the Budget and Finance Committee. I'll take no objection as a second. I'll let everybody say aye. Aye. We stand adjourned. Um, we'll be back. In, we're going to readjourn at 3 o'clock in 10 minutes. So um, we'll take a short break.